Hello, my name is Paula Reimer. I'm the director of the 14 Chrono Center for Climate, the Environment and Chronology. Today I'd like to talk to you about the background of radiocarbon dating. Uh, how does it work? What can be dated? How is it measured? And what is radiocarbon calibration? Why is it necessary? I'll also give a brief discussion of the dates for Takabu. Radiocarbon or carbon-14 is formed when cosmic rays bombard the Earth and create neutrons in the atmosphere which collide with nitrogen and form carbon-14. The carbon-14 then oxidizes to become CO2, carbon dioxide. There are other forms of carbon dioxide already existing all the time in the atmosphere. These are the stable forms of carbon, carbon-12 and carbon-13. All of these forms of carbon dioxide mix in the atmosphere and the ocean and are taken up by plants during photosynthesis. When animals or humans eat the plant, they record a signature of the carbon-14, 13, and 12 that was in the atmosphere at that time. However, that carbon-14 decays back to nitrogen at a known rate, whereas the 13 and 12 stay stable. So if we look at a plot of the percent of carbon-14 atoms remaining over time, we'll see that it decays exponentially. So that after one half-life, which is approximately 5,568 years, half of that carbon-14 will be gone. So for an unknown age sample, we can measure N, the number of 14 carbon atoms remaining, and we have this parameter called lambda from the Libby half-life of 5568 five, years. We get the number of original atoms from measuring a standard that represents the atmosphere, and then we can calculate the age before present. So what can be dated with radiocarbon? Well, just about anything that was once alive and less than 50,000 years old. For example, bone, wood, shells, nutshells, insects, plant fragments, papyrus, and many other things. So the way C14 is measured in our laboratory is a sample comes in and it's pre-treated to remove any contamination, parts of humic acids from soils or carbonates or various things that you don't want to date. They're not part of what you're after. It's converted to carbon dioxide and then that carbon dioxide is converted to graphite, which is pure carbon. The carbon atoms are then put into uh, an accelerator mass spectrometer and separated and counted. The type of sample pretreatment depends on the sample material itself and what the potential contaminant is. For example, uh, the hair from the Takabuti mummy was covered in sort of a reddish brown substance, which may have been henna, but we weren't sure that it was all henna and therefore contemporary. So this hair was put into what is called a soxlet extractor and various solvents were rinsed through it. And then finally it was rinsed in deionized water. Here are some before and after pictures of the hair. The samples then need to be combusted and graphitized. They're put into uh, quartz tubes on a vacuum line and sealed with a torch. That sealed tube it also contains copper oxide, which when combusted in an oven converts the carbon in the sample to carbon dioxide. You can see in one tube here, there's there's copper left behind, as well as some extra copper oxide. This tube on the left has a little bit of yellow material in it, which is probably sulfur, 
from the original sample that we also don't want to date. So we will be transferring that CO2 out of these tubes onto a graphite rig. We use hydrogen reduction to turn the carbon dioxide back into pure carbon. The sample is then pressed into what we call a target or cathode and put into a wheel to go into the AMS. This is a typical schematic of an accelerator uh, with two sources in this case. The sample wheel goes in either here or here. It's then uh, ionized and goes through a series of magnets, an accelerator tank, and finally an analyzing magnet that separates the stable isotopes for carbon-13 and carbon-12. And the carbon-14 goes on to a detector, detector where the carbon-14 atoms are counted. So now that we've done our measurements, we want to calculate our radiocarbon age using the law of radioactive decay. We've measured the carbon-14 in the sample relative to the stable carbon. That is N in our equation. We've corrected it for blanks. That is very ancient material that should have no carbon in it. We've also corrected it for fractionation, changes in the ratio of isotopes. And we've measured an international standard in order to get N naught, that is what is to represent the atmosphere at the time of formation. Then we simply have to re rearrange this equation and we get T, which is the age. A radiocarbon age is always reported as the 14C age BP, where 0 BP is equal to AD 1950. This equation assumes that N naught, the atmospheric 14C, has always been the same, that is constant. But it's not constant. We've known this since the 1960s from measurements of tree rings of known age. Why is the atmospheric C14 not constant? You would, we know that it's formed in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays coming in. And the background cosmic rays are relatively constant. But there are a number of things that affect how much carbon-14 is produced in the atmosphere. For one thing, the Earth has a geomagnetic field that shields it from cosmic rays to a certain extent. They're mainly able to get in at the poles where the field lines, the magnetic fields, are not strong. So the cosmic rays normally can get in through there and create C14. But if that field is very strong, they might not be able to. And if it's very weak, much more of them will get in. So that changes slowly over time uh, and will change the carbon-14 production. Another thing that greatly affects the amount of C14 is the sun. The solar activity uh, creates a wind of particles that bend our magnetic field lines around the Earth and provide shielding. When the sun is very active, there's more of that shielding going on and less C14 production, less cosmic rays able to get in. When the sun is quiescent, then more cosmic rays can get in. There's also smaller changes due to ocean circulation, the biosphere and geosphere changes, such as volcanoes, and anthropogenic input, such as fossil fuel and nuclear testing. So the effect of the atmospheric carbon-14 variations are to uh, change what would be a, a simple one-to-one -one correspondence so that at 1,000 AD, I would get 1,000 BP for my radiocarbon age. But that's not what happens. The C14 variations in the atmosphere change that. We know this for measuring tree rings that have uh, been dendrochronology dated. Uh, so we know exactly which year they formed. So 
we can then do what is called a calibration to correct for these uh, changes in the atmosphere. We have here shown in blue is the tree ring calibration curve for a short period of time. And we have the radiocarbon age from the Saqqara pyramid, which uh, is in Egypt. And <clears throat> it has an age of 4,158 plus or minus 21 BP. That's its radiocarbon age. That's one standard deviation or one sigma. And we plot this on the radiocarbon age axis as a distribution. We approximate a Gaussian distribution. But when that is transferred into the calibration curve, instead of just being a single dis unimodal distribution, it's spread out or can be spread out over the calendar axis. In this case, it covers a very wide range of possibilities at both the one sigma and two sigma. If we had had a date of up here around say 4250, then it wouldn't have interacted, intersected with this flat period or plateau in the curve. For Takabuti's hair, we measured a radiocarbon age of 2,531 plus or minus 20 BP. As you can see, we've plotted that on the radiocarbon age axis as a distribution again, but when it is transferred through the radiocarbon time scale calibration curve, it results in a number of possible ages. The, these possible calibrated ages range from 794 to 552 Cal BC. This is consistent with the Coffin stylistic age of the 25th dynasty, which I've plotted here in shading. Um, so the radiocarbon date doesn't prove or disprove uh, that Takabuti is from the 25th dynasty, but it definitely supports this hypothesis.